good afternoon to you all. Uh, we are extremely happy to have Professor Julia Otino amongst us today. Professor Otino will be delivering uh, the ninth technographics lex lecture today. Uh, previous eight uh, talks, uh, technographic lectures have been delivered by eminent academicians and scientists and uh, this has been made possible by a generous uh, donation by Technographics Foundation. The Technographics firm was founded by uh, Mr. Deepak Vaidya and he uh, obtained chemical the degree in chemical engineering from this institute in 1970. Okay. Uh, I welcome you all to, to today's talk and I would now like to request Professor Khakkar to introduce today's speaker to all the all of you who have gathered in this auditorium. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Well, uh, I'd like to start by saying that you know I've had the privilege to introduce uh, many distinguished people over the last few years. Last week. A convocation speaker was the Prime Minister of India and I did a brief introduction of him. And then in this particular auditorium, I introduced many people like uh, Montek Singh Aluwalia, some of you may have heard, Deputy Ch Chairman of the Planning Commission, Mr. Kapil Sibal, Minister for Human Resource Development. He came and gave a talk here, inaugurated this. And of course, the first person who spoke in this auditorium was Mr. Dmitry Medvedev, President of Russia. So, but today is a really rare and special honor for me to introduce Professor Julio Otino, uh, who is a distinguished chemical engineer, a teacher, and an academic administrator because of the personal connection that I have with him. Uh, Professor Otino was my PhD advisor and uh, Ten years after I finished my PhD, I reconnected with him and then we worked together on some research collaboration for more than ten years, which resulted in many nice papers and so forth. So it's really very special and it's probably a very rare occasion that one gets to introduce one's own advisor uh, for such a lecture. Professor Otino was born in Argentina and he completed his diploma in chemical engineering from the National University of La Plata in 1974. Uh, he is a talented artist and he could have made art his career, but he chose engineering as a profession, but he has continued with art as a hobby. Uh, his home and his office are adorned by his paintings and today's lecture also connects quite well with his deep interest in art. He completed his PhD from the University of Minnesota, which has one of the top chemical engineering departments in 1979 and then joined as a faculty member in the chemical engineering department at the University of Massachusetts immediately after he finished his PhD. So he joined in 1979. He continued there till 1991 when he moved to Northwestern University as the Walter P. Murphy Professor of Chemical Engineering and then in 2001 he was appointed the distinguished Robert R. McCormick Institute Professor he continues to hold both titles. He served as a chair of chemical engineering department from 92 to 2000 and the dean of the school of engineering from 2005 to now. Professor Otino's research areas are complex systems, granular dynamics, mixing and segregation and fluid mechanics of mixing. He has made many important contributions in these areas. And so let me just highlight a few of them because I know some of them. So his PhD research really was singular. I believe he was studying the mathematical framework of continuum mechanics with Professor Fosdick. And then using this foundation, he developed the first mathematical framework for the analysis of fluid mixing. Uh, if you read this, these papers, what I realize is that he went much beyond what both his PhD guides were doing and really 
I think that is really one of the key papers for those of us who work in fluid mixing. During his years at the University of Massachusetts, he took this step one step further and he cast the mixing process within the framework of mathematics of nonlinear dynamics and chaos. This work was consolidated in the now classic book, The Kinematics of Mixing, Stretching, Chaos and Transport, published by Cambridge University Press in 1989 and which has been reprinted in 1997 and 2004. The book has been cited more than a thousand times. If you look at the book, you will realize that, uh, you know, he is a very good artist because the book has lots of his hand drawn illustrations. At Northwestern, he continued his work, continued this work and also started new lines of work in granular dynamics and in complex systems. Uh, he has made seminal contributions in these areas as well. Professor Otino has published more than 170 research papers, uh, most of which are very well cited. Uh, many of the works have appeared on co uh, cover of journals like Science, Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and so forth, both because of their importance and because of their visual appeal. My path interact, intersected with Professor Otino's in 1981 when I joined UMass as a postgraduate student. Uh, soon after joining, I decided that I would like to work with Professor Otino for my PhD and really just for one reason, uh, because he was the best teacher that I had ever come across. Besides, so what I want, the point I want to make is that besides being a highly accomplished researcher, he is also an outstanding teacher. Uh, to this day, he remains my favorite teacher and I enjoy listening to his talks, which of course always give me new insights. Professor Otino has made many important contributions as an academic administrator, both as chair of chemical engineering and as dean of engineering. One major change that he has made at Northwestern is to transform the engineering curriculum to make it more of a whole brain activity so that how the new curriculum includes greater aspects of design, perspective thinking and some elements of art as well. Professor Otino has served on many important committees and boards which include the International Advisory Board of University of California, Santa Barbara, the National Research Council Benchmarking Committee for US Chemical Engineering, the International Review of Engineering in the UK. Uh, of EPSRC and the Royal Acad Academy of Engineering. He was chair of the NAE Peer Review Committee for Chemical Engineering and a member of the NAE Committee for on Membership. He was a founding editor and I think this is a really very nice contribution that he made. He was a founding editor of the Perspectives section of the AICHE journal and associate ed editor of the journal from, from 94 to 2006. This perspective section has become very important in the journal now. He has been a technical advisor to Unilever for several years. He had been actually and during that time he visited India several times. Professor Otino has been recognized by numerous awards. I was a student and I remember the excitement in the department when he got the Presidential Young Investigator Award in 1984. He has since received many others including the Alan P. Colburn Award and the William Walker Award of the AICHE, the Fluid Dynamics Prize of the American Physical Society, the Guggenheim Fellowship and so on. He has delivered many important lectures including the Dankwart's Memorial Lecture in London which is published in the Chemical Engineering Science Journal as well as the Lacey Lectures at Caltech. He has been selected as one of the 100 engineers of the modern era by AICHE. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has been elected to the National Academy of Engineering of the US and he was elected in 97. Uh, Professor Otino's career has been characterized by a high level of creativity and a broad vision 
and his work has made an impact in fields far beyond chemical engineering. It is thus my pleasure to invite Professor Otino to deliver the ninth Technographics Lecture, Creativity in Art, Technology and Science. Professor Julio Otino. Well, I, I hope I can live up to that introduction. So, if any of you are thinking of making a career in academia, try to get a student like the bank be one of your first students. <laughs> uh, I have had lengthy introductions, but none of them meant so much as this one. Uh, because in many cases, the, the introduction is uh, kind of actually removed from what one has done. But with the bank, uh, given our close relationship, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for those words. I'm extremely grateful. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here. I should have been here many, many years ago. But I'm glad that I'm here, and I'm glad for being given this lecture and the support of Technographics. So I, I put some ideas together in here. Um, I haven't, it's a mix of things that I have done, but the, the mix is unique. So I have never done this. So I will be interested in getting a copy of the lecture when it's recorded. There are several messages in here. Um, so let me start by, by kind of telling you what is that I'm going to tell you. Okay, so, so the, what I'm going to tell you is basically three things. Uh, one part, which is semi-historical, some of you may have heard about these things, is when art and science were one, before the word science existed. I'm going to get into some little kind of history about Galileo because he's a pivotal person. He's the best example of art in the service of science that I know of, but everything changed after Galileo. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about art, technology, science. How do they grow? Because if you're in the science side, we, we tend to romanticize art. We associate creativity with art. And I'm going to try to dispel that myth. And, and then at the end, I will give you some lessons. And the lessons are, if you want to think in this in terms of innovation, there are lessons on that side. Okay? So the first thing that I'm going to do is kind of start with an apology. J.H. Um, Hardy, who was the person who discovered Ramanujan, and I understand is the 150th anniversary of his birth, he said, there is no score more profound and on the whole more justified, he, he wrote this when he was in his twilight, that that of the men who do, he regarded doing mathematics or doing something, for the men who explain. That's basically what I'm going to do here. Exposition, criticism, and appreciation is work for second-rate minds. So I'm, I'm going to start with an apology because that's more or less what I'm going to do. Explain, okay? So the first thing that I want to do is, is to talk about the myth of creativity. Okay? This is Newton looking at the falling apple. There is no record that this ever existed. It's a myth propagated actually by French. Voltaire is the one who propagated this. And one of the things that I'm going to do is this myth of epiphany and the myth of a sudden genius. Uh, now, because this is deeply ingrained, uh, none other than Kant, one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived, 
he put artistic creativity on a much higher plane than mathematical creativity or physical creativity. For example, he, he argued that Newton was not as creative as Homer because in the case of Newton, never mind that this is not probably true, you could follow the steps in a logical sequence and therefore could be repeatable by someone else, whereas in the case of creating poetry by Homer, never mind that Homer probably didn't write any of what was claimed that was written by him, it was a composite of many historical figures, it suddenly came out of nowhere. Okay, so but that's a myth that is still prevailing today. Uh, now, geniuses, we associate geniuses a lot with art, and the more tragic, the better. Okay, uh, Arthur Rimbaud composed all the poetry that he ever wrote by the age of 20, and then he disappeared from the face of the earth and died at 37. And of course, you know about Mozart, and the fact that he died composing the Requiem also makes him more tragic. So these are people who seemingly got touched by God with this creativity. And there are other people, for example, you all are familiar with this one, um, died at also uh, 32. Um, no one knows where the ideas came from. Tragic end. Uh, England was not the best place to be a strict vegetarian at that time. Uh, even more tragic is Galois. Um, I don't know if you ever received letters of recommendations, but I don't think you will ever get one stronger than this. This letter is perhaps the most substantial piece of writing in the whole literature of mankind. So the, the story is Galois failed twice entering the Col Polytechnic, arguably because he skipped steps and he got angry with examiners because he couldn't, they couldn't follow his reasoning. Eventually, he had some ideas, submitted a paper, one went into the hands of Cauchy, Cauchy sat in the paper for a long while, then another paper went into the hands of Fourier, Fourier died while he had the paper in there, and one night, he scribbled everything that he had in his head. This is the letter that uh, Herman Weyl is alluding to. Wrote everything, everything that he wrote is 60 pages long, okay? Everything, that letter was much shorter. Every paper that he ever wrote, you can collect it in 60 pages. He wrote that, then left his home, went into a duel and got killed at 20, okay? And so if this is not a genius, I don't know what is it, because it's all the combination of tragedy and influence. I mean, there is something called Galois theory, and without him, we won't have many branches of math. Nevertheless, this is kind of rare. So if we have art, technology, and science as the three largest receptacles of human creativity through the ages, uh, things that get passed from one generation to the next, okay, because things are documented, there are pieces of work that get written down. The, the words that we can associate with them, roughly speaking, are with science is discovered. We believe that there is something like an objective reality, and what science does is lift the veil and reveals what maybe was already there. If Watson and Crick had not discovered the starting of the double helix, someone else would have. Technology is an invention, and since we are not in art in here, we will associate art with creation. But no artist that I know of associates what they do with creation. They will use words like provoking, transforming, challenging. Creation is a byproduct. You go, work, sweat, and a creative output is what sometimes happens. So art is not really 
equated with creation. That's one thing that I want you to take out. And I'm leaving, I mentioned art, technology, and science. There are several things that are left out of the picture. One of them is math. And what is math? Is math creation? Some parts of computer science which are connected with math are connected with creation. But many mathematicians are kind of platonists. They think that they discover things, that they exist regardless of them being the one to do the unveiling. So it's both creation and discovery. So I'm leaving several things out in here. And math is one of them. Now, to so start with creativity and science before there was science, let me start with Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci thought that art, and especially painting, was a means to uncovering reality. And if you go and look at the collected works, part of which now in the hands of Bill Gates and the other half in the hands of the Queen of England, and you see these drawings about turbulence and anatomical drawings, it was a way of exploring reality. Uh, but at the time of Da Vinci, there was no such a thing as something called science. Science probably, in the way that we understand it now, maybe goes back to Francis Bacon and maybe Galileo. Now, let me, let me kind of mention Galileo for a second because it's a pivotal figure in, in this story. So Galileo, so I'll focus on one story only, okay? Galileo, besides being a great, uh, an accomplished physicist and being able to hold his weight on anything that was called theory subsequently, he had many talents, and one of them was he was a very, a very talented instrument maker. So he was at the frontier building telescopes, and he had built one at the same time that the person on the right of the screen, Thomas Harriot, built one. Now, they both look at many things. For example, he was able to discover that the Milky Way actually was connected many, many, many stars. He was able to see the moon's Jupiter. But one of the first things that he did was to observe the moon. Now, Galileo, I said, had many, many talents. He, for example, applied to the position of mathematician to l'Accademia del Disegno. L'Accademia del Disegno was a, a very important creation in Florence because it brought people who are going to be painters and architects and engineers and anybody into a common framework, and they were all trained in exercises in perspective. Uh, so all of those drawings and the shadows that they projected were part of what they have to absorb. There were things like theorems behind, and in there, I'm, I think I mentioned one, um, like something that is uh, exercises and demonstrations and this and that. So everybody who was in Florence and was in this line of work was training this. Galileo knew about this stuff. He applied for the position of mathematician in the Academia del Diseño and was rejected. Eventually, he got accepted in the Academia del Diseño because of his strength as a painter. Okay? But this, this was the atmosphere that he was living in. On the other hand, Harriot in England had nothing comparable. There was no art of note in London where he was at the time, while Galileo was absorbing this. So when it went to record what they had seen about the moon, Galileo did the drawings on the right. They were watercolors. He recorded the observations. Harriot, the drawing on the left. But they both saw the same image, but Galileo immediately recognized that what he was seeing were shadows of craters. He was able to calculate the depth of the craters and the height of basically mountains in the moon. This was a very significant thing because up to that moment, 
the moon was regarded as a perfect sphere. Uh, now, you look at the moon with your naked eye and you see that it has shadows, but these people had all sorts of explanations of why the shadows were. They thought that it was a perfect mirror and the shadows were reflections of the earth, or they were internal structures of the moon. So dispelling this went, everybody knows about uh, the problems that he had with the church, but this was another problem, not so big, but the moon was pure, so pure that the Virgin was depicted on top of the moon, okay? So Galileo, this example was an example of science that was driven by art. But Galileo, of course, was the beginning of the scientific method, okay? More than anybody, Newton benefited from Galileo. Uh, uh, the, 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 all the foundations were built on his shoulders. And science changed after Galileo. It became uh, the power of mathematics transformed science, to the point that science became very, very abstract and people were not happy just putting in front, I'm, I'm going to touch this again, happy putting in front, maybe it was in the background, things that were regarded as kind of metaphorical or why the insight came it was all a perfect edifice, to the point that Laplace, for example, when he wrote Celestial Mechanics, and a book was given as a present to Napoleon, uh, he commented to Laplace, Sir, I do not see the mention of God in here, and Laplace's response was, Sir, I do not have a need for that hypothesis. And Lagrange, for example, pride himself from having written a book that contained absolutely no pictures whatsoever, okay? You will find no picture in my book. It was all math-based. However, there were people, the, the picture, no picture thing was not clear. Uh, for example, on the non-picture side, you have Lagrange, but on the picture side, you have someone like Hilbert. So Hadamard, who was a famous French mathematician said that you will find a diagram in every other page in Hilbert. And the picture on who was on each side, take your pick. Heisenberg was no pictures. Probably Meyer Heisenberg, but if you are Meyer Feynman, he was on the picture side. So you decide what column you want to be. So a word about the origins of this art science. So Art, you can say, is art as old as humanity itself. Technology was not called technology, but once you make something and made many repeated copies of something, you, you are doing technology. Clearly, when you are building aqueducts or the, the dome in the Pantheon of Rome, you are clearly doing technology. By the way, it's noteworthy that we have no idea of the name associated with the creation of things like this. For example, we do not know, we know who commissioned things, what were the emperors, but we do not know who was the main architect behind, for example, the Great Wall of China, or the dome in Rome of the Pantheon. Creativity was not associated with individuals up to the Renaissance. And science, Science is kind of a baby. It's 500 years old if you associate it with Galileo, maybe 350 if you associate it with the birth of the Royal Academy. In fact, the word science, this is one of these rare instances in which we know exactly when the word was coined. And it was 1834 and it was invented by the British in, in that very meeting, okay? First clear record, everybody agrees with this. But if you actually go and Google, and it's possible to find out the usage of every word in the 15 or 18 percent of books scanned by Google, you discover that art has existed for a long, long time. Science, before 1770, barely existed, 
and technology is remarkably young. We know, for example, who was the first president in the US to use the word technology once. The one who used it twice in an inaugural speech was Ronald Reagan. That's how recent it is. Okay? So the, the, the way that these things evolve, the methodology, science is the most organized of them all. In fact, the biggest discovery of science is science itself. There are revolutions in science, but science has this steady growth. There are not that many dead branches in science. You go add knowledge, sometimes the best thing that could happen to anybody in this institute is that you find out that someone really well known screw up on something and you write a paper and disprove it. That makes you famous. But there are very few instances like that. It's mostly steady accumulation and the revolutions are few. Quantum mechanics being one, maybe the, the origins of uh, cell and molecular biology is another one, very few. You stand on the shoulders of giants in science. You build on previous knowledge. In technology, the only reason to stand on the shoulders of someone else is to crush them. You want to replace one technology by another one. You don't wait until the technology is exhausted. You just build constantly and you try to replace a paradigm before the paradigm gets uh, actually exhausted. Art is the most kind of chaotic of them all. You, you wouldn't have any competitive advantage by painting like Monet now or Renoir or Van Gogh. It has been done. You have to do something else. So it's a constant reinvention, especially as you approach the 21st century. In fact, these uh, paintings they were all done in between, I would say, 1890, 1950. If I were displaying them on a table and asking them, put them in order, there is no way on earth that you can do it and unless you really have taken several courses in the history of art. In fact, these, they are all sort of the same period. And these two, in fact, were produced by the same person. They look completely different, but is by Gerald Richter, who is probably the most, certainly the, the, the artist that has sold things for the highest price in the world now, still alive. So how do ideas grow in these domains? The ideas grow in this domain, uh, and this diagram tries to explain this. In every domain, there is something called the domain, and the domain is what would exist even if the people who were the responsible for the creation of these things wouldn't exist. So these are papers, books, patents, knowledge, paintings, compositions of different kinds. The domain is what, if we were obliterated from Earth and these things exist, the domain will exist. But the domain has gatekeepers. And the, this is the field. The field are the people who practice in the domain and the, the people who are the arbiters of what gets into the domain. In science, it's pretty clear. In, in order for something to be adopted and be part of the domain, it has to be published. Someone has to review it, accept it. Just because it's accepted doesn't mean that it's forever. It's but let's face it, most of the things that get published are not earth shattering. Okay? Uh, eventually, the domain makes a conscious decision that this should belong as part of this. In art, the same thing. There are people who decide what is worth of inclusion in museums, uh, but there is more revisionism in, in art than in technology. And in, in technology, it's the most democratic. Everybody decides what gets adopted. So, something is creative if the field collectively decides that it's creative, okay? Now, as I said before, last time, uh, before the Renaissance, uh, creativity was re thought to reside in muses and was supposed to touch human beings at the distance 
And that was the source of inspiration and creativity. But that's why we do not know the names of people who created some things that we regard as quite significant. In the Renaissance, the pendulum shift the other way. And the idea of what constituted the first burst of the idea of something, what is called the primo pensieri, became the important thing. So drawings like this became truly important. Those drawings gave rise to ideas like this, and eventually they were like the, the trademark, the pattern, the intellectual property, those drawings that eventually gave give rise to something like, like that. So now, paradoxically, even though we mention art, science, technology, invention, creation, and discovery, and we mention the word creation with art, at least in the popular mind, if you want to know how something was uh, created or so, how something evolved, the art is probably the, the most documentable of them all. Because every, whereas not every draft of a paper that we write survives, especially now, every drawing, a sketch of a famous artist survives. And there are several instances in which we saw the evolution. For example, in an etching by Rembrandt, this is one of the, the intermediate ones, this is one of the last ones. Invariably, you see an idea going too far and kind of ruin it, okay? But you see the same idea repeated over and over again. So, for example, this theme of Picasso will appear over again. In here you see sketches of Picasso for something called Le Demoiselles d'Avignon. Uh, and this is the, what is regarded as one of the final, the final painting, which is in the moment in New York. Uh, Monet painted this like in every possible condition. So it's not that one was produced. Uh, and the ultimate case of repetition, this is pretty recent, is Damien Hirst, is an English contemporary author, which is basically painting dots. Uh, it's, but it's, is the act of acquiring style. In here you see exercises from Matisse before producing what may be the iconic final picture, which is in the in Russia at the, at the um, Hermitage. But one of the things that is important, uh, in here we see Matisse. I do not know how well you can see it from there with light. Uh, when someone like Matisse went and painted, he didn't go on to the studio thinking, well, today I, I'm going to paint a masterpiece. It's just every artist goes every day and paints. This is probably what you think people in science do. You show up, you do something. Some days you do something good. Many, many days, nothing major happens. So when Matisse was stuck, not knowing what to paint, he painted his studio with a painting in the background. That's one. This is another one. You just go and work, OK? But how do ideas, new ideas, occur? One, one concept that I like, which is due to Stuart Kaufman, who is a theoretical biologist, is the concept of the adjacent possible. At any given point, in any domain, there is a frontier is the frontier, you get to see it by visiting places like this. There are people who are at the edge. Uh, they cannot see kind of going an epsilon away, but sometimes you can connect two ideas and you move in there. So if you are at the, at the adjacent possible, maybe possible for you to break through the boundary, to produce a breakthrough, Sometimes if the breakthrough is important enough, it has to be a break with, because in order for the new idea to birth through the boundaries, you have to really break with ideas that they were very dear to you in the past. Every new idea that is of note requires you breaking with an idea of the past. This is some connection with the innovation picture in here. So there are examples of people who are really always at this adjacent possible. One documented case is Kelvin. Kelvin had lots of ideas. 
several of his ideas were ideas that were done in conjunction independently with other people. So these other people were different groups. For example, one group was people like Stokes, Green, Hemholtz, Cavendish, Poincaré, really class A people in science. The other one were probably kind of a notch below, Lame, Faf. Now, the fact that Kelvin had ideas that these people had at the same time that not diminish Kelvin's greatness. But what indicates is that even to sort of produce the same ideas that Kelvin produced, a subset actually of the ideas that Kelvin produced, you needed this big entourage of first-rate people. But he was always at this adjacent possible. Now, this gives rise to what is called simultaneous discoveries. In fact, uh, Steven Stigler, who was in the University of Chicago, said something is called Stigler's Law that said no scientific discovery is named after the original discoverer, including Stigler's Law, because <laughs> this fellow Robert Merton said it before. Okay? So sometimes he's the first person who connects with the right crowd, the one who puts in the most elegant form, but this idea that there are several people at this adjacent possible coming with uh, similar ideas at the same time is very, very, very common in science, especially now. Sometimes it helps to be at the right place at the right time. This is one of the most illustrious photographs ever taken. But all of these people, I mean, look at the names. Schrodinger, Pauli, Heisenberg, Debye, Knudsen, Bragg, Dirac, Compton, De Broglie, Born, Niels Born, Lagmuir, Planck, Madame Curie, Lorenz, Einstein, Langevin. They are not all of them, okay? But they, they all became famous because the, the field was bursting with new ideas and they all could pluck different things from that same receptacle of open problems. They were all at the boundary of this adjacent possible at the same time. So we mentioned how ideas come into being. And one of the biggest deceptions in science, and the biggest problem that people have, students, in fact, you read these papers, and especially if it's a great paper, it looks perfect. And you have no idea, you have the faintest idea on how the idea came into being. So some people have commented on this. Two of the ones that I like the most are Hemholtz, which describe that when you reach the top and you have to give a talk like this and say, how is that you did that great thing? You describe a royal path, kind of heroic, okay? But you don't describe the shaky ladder that took you there, the, all the tentative steps. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, one of the most famous philosophers, who, by the way, had a degree in engineering, he put it more aptly, and he called it kicking the ladder. Or the one that I like the most of the quotes is, the secret to creativity is knowing how to hide your sources. <laughs> so a little bit about reading the future. I'm going to go quickly through here. So if you are in this adjacent possible, depending on the time, there are times that are really ripe for benefits if you are the right person at the right time. So for example, and how do you know this? The answer is you never know. In my view, life is like driving an impenetrable fog. In front of you, all of us can see only five feet ahead. But in the rear view mirror, everything is perfectly clear. Okay? So, but Becoming good at this business of reading the future is becoming more and more and more important. So every two years, IBM, for example, does a report where they interview thousands of CEOs. So this is the N minus one report. The last report was released probably a couple of months ago. 
and they ask the question, what's the most important issue facing today? What's the most transforming thing? In the last one, by the way, more than anything else, the answer was technology, more than economics, technology. But in this one that was done uh, in 2010, they ask CEOs two questions. What's the most important problem facing you today? And the other is, what's the most important characteristic that leaders have to have to prosper in this world? The, the number one issue was complexity, and the number one characteristic to defy complexity was creativity. I believe that creativity can be, if not learned, if you have the desire, you can at least not hinder it in you or others. So the problem is, and this, this will be a very short detour on something that comes dear to me, is that sometimes our thinking is, is not appropriate to the times. We still live in a kind of linear world. So for example, if we face a problem, and this could be many, many examples, like the decreasing population of cod in the North Atlantic, we tend to try to find a reason. And one reason is we know that the harp seals eat the cod. The cod feeds from plankton, but we, we can think in this linear space and we, we kind of think that, oh, if we control the population of seals, we can somehow take care of the problem. The problem is that in most cases, and I mentioned this as one example, in most, most cases, when you look at all the elements, for example, in this case, looking at all the elements will be looking at all the species that interact in the North Atlantic, the problem sort of looks like that. And the, the thinking of seeing that one species, how they will affect the other one, is kind of ridiculous. But this, this is the way that we, we have to deal with problems that require adaptation, for example, propagation of epidemics, which is depicted on, on the left in there. The problem is that most of the education is still in engineering, is we train people to deal with complicated systems rather than complex systems. Complicated systems are systems in which we have the power of deciding what function every part of the system will do. And when you put them together, they operate in some kind of fashion, like every little piece in a 747 has to make the plane fly as prescribed. But it's not that if the plane loses something, there will be a growth, automatic growth to replace that, uh, like in an ecology. We have dealt mostly with complicated problems rather than complex problems. So, but in moments where there are technologies coming together, there are opportunities. So let me mention one or two examples of these conferences. And in here, I like to, to make this, bring this quote. I think there is actually very little distinction between an artist and a scientist or engineer of the highest caliber. This was done in an interview that Jobs had in 1995. So let me mention a couple of examples. We all know about Samuel Morse because of the telegraph. Now, this is something in now in the domain of electrical engineering. When Morse was growing up and going to Yale, there was exactly one course in electricity in Yale. He took that course. But Morse's profession was as a painter. He was a very accomplished painter. He was elected to the Royal Academy of Arts, for example. But something tragic happened to him. His wife died when he was, she was living in, in New Haven and he was doing a painting in, in Washington. And he had the idea that there has to be a way of transmitting news faster than a guy coming with a horse and delivering a letter to me. And he started uncovering this and the time was ripe for something like the telegraph take place. The same way with Daguerre. Daguerre was a set painter. 
But eventually he was a fellow who discovered part of the chemistry to produce pictures. Uh, sometimes the ideas, you, you are at the wrong place or too early or too late, as you can, you can argue. For example, this fellow, Joseph Faber, was a fellow who tried to produce a device to reproduce human voice. Now, but in the time in which he was living, there was nothing like no one could dream up of something digital. So when we try to produce something to reproduce human voice, he tried to produce actually like the head of a person with all the associated tubing and air going through. Uh, apparently, the idea was important enough that got that little mention in, in the Times of London, but the, the guy got committed suicide, his... Uh, I think his nephew tried to continue with the idea, eventually went nowhere because it was a good idea, but the right, the wrong kind of technology behind. So, but in these moments of conference, sometimes things come together. One moment in the history of mankind where the idea came together, I mentioned science didn't exist as science, it was called natural philosophy, before 18, 1770, something like that. But this society, for example, called the Lunar Society in Birmingham, it was called the Lunar Society because they met during the full moon, because it was easy to walk home, there was electricity was barely there, so they could find a way of walking home. This was the first time in which the people who studied the the how, okay, the propositional uh, knowledge or, or the what things happen and the proto-scientists met with the people who they knew to do things, the how people, the engineers, and with the entrepreneurs. So, for example, uh, people who are scientists, uh, like Darwin, uh, this was actually the grandfather of the Darwin of evolution, and Priestley, who we know from chemistry, met with people like Watt, who were engineers, and Smithson, who was, Smithson was probably the first big time consulting engineer. He made a fortune. With people who are entrepreneurs. Uh, if any of you collect porcelain or things like that, you will know the name Bolton and Wedgwood. So these were the people who study things with the people who know how to apply the science, with the people who actually could make stuff. This resulted in an explosion of things, okay? And when you study the, the, the collision of things that make an idea flourish, it's usually more than two things. Two things is kind of easy to combine. Three is much harder. So I'm going to go very, very quickly. So I mentioned Morse. So for Morse to come with the idea, he needed an electromagnet to be there, batteries, and even if those two things were in place, if you couldn't make miles and miles of cable, you got nothing, okay? Uh, Daguerre, you needed a chemistry to record images and a chemistry to focus images, and also the idea of a camera obscura, and like that with many, many ideas. From Henry Ford was not the first person coming with the idea of uh, the concept of the assembly line. He was simply the first person who made a successful application of the concept of the assembly line. But in order to produce car after car, there has to be plenty of gasoline and the, the engine has to be perfected. If, if these things were not all in conference, you get nowhere. And like that, you can mention many, many things, including up to the internet, if you want, with uh, Vinton Cerf, who is, is very much still alive and still working in, in Google. And you can argue in the same way and dissect the iPhone. The, you hear many, many times there is no new technology behind the iPhone, but several things had to come together to make this thing probably the most indispensable part of our lives now. So I want to end up with a few lessons that I think are worth learning that come from the, the right side of the brain. Okay? I alluded to this a, a little bit. I alluded that with Lagrange, things got very, very analytical, and everything that is analytical, math, logical, thinking, that kind of things, the skill that 
places like Caltech, MIT, IIT, kind of self-select for people who are really good in the math side. These are kind of left brain skills, okay? As opposed to artistic, metaphorical, divergent, and everything that I'm saying is a metaphor, which I'm going to call right brain skills. But to kind of hone on the idea, let me give you one example. People have studied uh, damaged brain patients, either because they have had massive lessons that have made them lose one side of the hemisphere, or prior to the 60s, uh, some people were actually, who had schizophrenia, were uh, treated by severe in the connection between the hemispheres. In fact, William Sperry, who was in Caltech, Caltech has no medical school, he won the Nobel Prize of Medicine by studying people like this. So, one example coming from San Diego. People are given that image, and then they are asked, tell me what you see. So the people who have only the left brain active, they see that. And people who have only the right brain active, they see this. The point that I'm trying to make in here is, in general, you need both. You need the details and you need the big picture. Big picture is good if you have lots of people who can take out the details, but probably you'll never be the guy at the top of a heap dealing with the big picture unless you have mastered the details. In reality, you need both. Uh, if you only see details always, probably you'll never have big impact. So what are the lessons? I show Matisse with paintings like this, and I saw this, and then I saw this. So what's the lesson from here? The lesson is, inspiration is overrated. You work. Okay? This is Picasso at 15. Picasso at 22, maybe Picasso at 40. Picasso, sorry, this is probably 27, 40. This is William de Kooning, early. William de Kooning, this is in the Art Institute in Chicago. This, I want to tie it up whatever lesson is in there with this. Leonardo has seven attributed paintings, but you have to recognize the fellow was busy doing other things, okay? Vermeer, only 36. Rembrandt, 600 plus. Van Gogh, just to give an idea, 900 in the last two and a half years. Picasso, and he kept this for 70 years, did about a painting every 2.2 days. Okay? Andy Warhol, but his career was shorter, about one and a quarter things for every day that he was working. So what are the lessons in here? The first one is, start with a solid grounding. If you don't have the solid grounding, you never even see the details, okay? And equate creation with hard work. You show up and work. The myth that artists create when they are inspired is just a myth. This is a sculpture from Picasso. And this is a close-up. So all the sculpture is done with found parts. Like the head is two toy cars, kind of put together, and actually, if you see the sculpture and you see how it's made, you can see the, the toy cars. But the lesson in here is this, adapt and adopt. And I love this, bad artists copy, great artists steal. <laughs> okay? The steal part is when one of those three technologies that I was talking about becomes part of your idea. Copying is just copying. This is Picasso, and the story about this painting, which is also in the Art Institute in Chicago, is that he was showing around his studio to one fellow who was a partner in Skidmore, who is the fellow who did the Sears Tower, now called the Willis Tower. And he said, oh, I, I 
I think show a, a catalog and said, I have seen this painting of yours. And Picasso said, yeah, I remember that painting. I remember when I was trying to come up with something that represented what I thought at the time. And at the end, I look at it and I decide I was not happy. And I modify the painting. By the way, I cut a piece. And if you want the piece that I cut, I'll give it to you. And the Art Institute has both pieces. And the piece that he cut it was something like that. There was a man holding a fish and the baby was trying to touch the fish. The lesson here is, and this applies to many, many things. I, I don't think that there is no paper that can be improved by condensing it. But applies to committee work, especially if there are many, many people, okay? A step back, look at the whole picture and decide if what you achieved is what you wanted to achieve. Remember this idea of cutting things. The other one is, do not, I mean, if, if there is one thing that is the secret for creative thought, is never pick the first idea that comes to your mind. Do not converge too quickly. Always have something floating in parallel. So finally, this is the final and most important lesson. Again, this is Picasso, a series of lithographs. And this is the final one. But, so I started with a few lines and then became this. But Picasso actually, if you look at the dates, did it the other way around. This is the last one. So the lesson is to be able to do both things. You have to be able to see simplicity in complexity and complexity in simplicity. Very few people can do both. Now, there are lots of examples that one could use, and I could, in retrospective, have used an example of something that maybe the bank and I work. Uh, in, in, instead, I, I try, try to pick one that is more of a classic. And the, I pick this one. Okay, this is the entire paper by Watson and Crick. Okay, 900 words. One figure that I think was done by Crick's wife. Okay, um, the paper has been analyzed to death with regard to the writing. Uh, start, this is the beginning sentence, is, is double tentative. We wish tentative, to suggest, again tentative, a possible structure for DNA, okay? This is probably a big understatement, okay? This structure has properties of considerable biological interest. Now, in order to come up with this picture, and they were competing with Linus Pauling, who was hot in their heels in Caltech, okay? They consulted with everybody. If you ever read the teeny little book by Watson, The Double Helix, they were talking with astrophysicists. They, 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 they tried to get ideas from everywhere. So out of all of those ideas, including pictures from this woman who many believe deserved the Nobel Prize with them, Rosalind Franklin, they converge and produce that picture. Okay? In some sense, that's what a theory is. You have lots of these connected things, and suddenly there is one crisp and clear picture. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is that from that picture, there are consequences. And if that sentence was an understatement, this is even more so. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible coping mechanism. In fact, all biotech is contained into that picture. Okay? So, so these are the ideas that I wanted to convey to you. And in fact, if you remember, one idea about this talk is the seeing simplicity in complexity. And more importantly, when you have a simple picture, seeing how that picture can ramify. Okay? That's a, 
a lot of innovation is actually seen the second thing. From one picture, seeing all the consequences. So as a summary, I, I try to tell you a little bit about when art and science were one, because I think knowing this, the things is important, rather than diminishing creativity, I think can inspire people knowing how this conference were. Then a little bit about the relationship between art, technology, and science. I said very little about technology. And then I tried to put myself in one of these vertices in the triangle, art, and try to give you lessons. And the final lesson I want to kind of leave with you is the one seeing simplicity in complexity and complexity in simplicity. Again, I want to thank for the opportunity of giving this lecture, especially to the bank, uh, and I will be delighted to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. This is the first time I uh, heard you speak on this topic. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating. Yes. No one is a prophet in his own land. <laughs> yeah. Very illuminating. Yeah. My question is, uh, I mean, this is a fantastic example of artists, scientists, but that was in a different era where the communication to some extent was limited. So perhaps Europe was advanced, so there was some communication within Europe or within the artists. How do you contextualize as we are in this information age and particularly with emerging economies, people in nominally underrepresented parts of the world in the yesteryears are now hungry and eager can you see uh, any paradigm change coming up, or it just uh, evolution? Uh, so, uh, let, let me complete the question and ask two questions. These are the two questions that everybody wants the answer to. Um, sometimes corporations, sometimes all Singapore. Okay. One is a. How do we produce creative people? And the second question is how do we have creative organizations that can foster creativity. Okay? The, so, yeah, the the, regarding the, the, the question that you ask, the, the, the question that is somehow hidden behind your question is, at what point, there is a fellow who gives really great talks. Is, um, you can look at the talks in TED. It's called Ken Robinson, actually Sir Ken Robinson. And he, he has this battle in which he thinks, uh, actually, the one who said this is also Picasso. He said, uh, it took me 40 years to learn again to draw like a child. Okay? He, he thinks that we educate people out of creativity. People start creative, and then we educate them out of it. And the question is, when, when do you have the point of no return? My, my, my sense is, uh, pre-college is very easy. Even immediately after college is easy. If you wait, I don't know, five years, ten years after that is extremely, extremely tough. Okay? So, the, the fact that there is more communication means that there are more opportunities to have these effective collisions. Actually, more communication should lead to more explosion of things because is if people who normally couldn't come in contact, then now they come in contact more frequently. But it's only certain kind of people, the ones who can have those collisions. Many people cannot. But uh, in startups now in Silicon Valley, I'm not advocating for this. The, many of them are including artists. I'll give you one example. We haven't done this, but we are going to do it, and I am more or less sure that the results will be good. So we're, we started programming analytics. Everybody in the complexity analytics, it's, it's a way to understand the world. However, we are going to have a course where we will bring together the people who do analytics, people who 
are trained in applied math and statistics and this and that. But we are going to do the course with the Art Institute. And for these people, have, having to explain how they, actually the title of the course is, is, is telling, is data as art. So you start working in your own domain, you become very, very comfortable with a way of explaining things. If you want to explain it to people who are used to manipulating things in many different ways, chances are that you will advance the thing. So the fact that more communication exists now, I think it's even more of a chance that there will be more of an explosion of ideas. But yeah, no, you have to filter them. But I think that uh, the people who are prepared are going to benefit tremendously by, by these uh, new interactions. Yeah. I will raise the first big question uh, you discussed, which is for Kant. Yeah. Uh, how do you judge relative creativity within science? How do you judge it? How, how do you judge something is more creative than something else? So, first, I'll, 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 I'll give you two answers. The first one is the people who collectively decide how creative something is, is the field. So the field is the people who are in the domain, let's say the domain is fluid dynamics, and the, these people have uh, the ability to bestow recognition to creative ideas by, I don't know, inviting you to talks, sometimes awards, that kind of thing. So it's the field that, I mean, I will be, let me just admit something. The ability to market ideas is tremendously important in science. Probably the only place that you can put an idea there and just let the field decide and it doesn't matter how nice you are, how your personality is, is pure math. Okay? They decide if the idea is worth accepting, they will just go through the proof. You can be a hermit, like this guy Grigory Perelman in, in Russia who didn't bother to accept, accept the, the, one of the clay prizes or the Fields Medal. That's the ultimate uh, field where the decision is completely objective. Okay? In any other field, the way that the field responds to an idea being creative is by the collective response. Okay? Personally, I think that the way that people do things sometimes is such that, um, I mean, there are theories that are nice and beautiful and some that are really convoluted, but I will go further than that. I will go that in some cases, if it were possible to, to show a page in a paper or two and you cross a name, in some cases you can decide who did what. This is style. It's not that it's style free. So in, in things like arts, it's all a style. I would say in science there is a style, it's not as apparent, but I don't subscribe to the Kant idea that just because you can follow a logical sequence is not creative. I, I would say that uh, the, the way that something comes across, the way that something uh, holds together uh, is, is the, 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 it has a mark of the creator. And the creator could be someone in science. That's my, my own, my own view. Yeah. I was a little disappointed when you said that hard work really is. I was hoping that creative people could get away with less hard work. Uh, but it looks like even has to work hard. You can pretend that just to make other people feel miserable, but my, my view is that you have to work really hard. Uh, so, you know, I, I uh, want to uh, have your views on something which has been debated in this auditorium for the last uh, few weeks very vigorously. Uh, that is the kind of exam that we conduct for selecting students to the IITs. Uh, 
uh, who, uh, you know, as you're saying, should uh, have uh, creative as well as, you know, other kind of analytical abilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, wh wh what uh, should one do uh, to make sure that we get the right uh, people who have the, you know, uh, highest chance of uh, making a success? I don't have a clear answer to that. I mean, you could follow the Bauhaus uh, example in which you put people, this will be hard to do, but with, I don't know, a hundred thousand people, you, you put them in a room with a lot of junk and you say, build something out of this, I'll come back in, come back in an hour. Okay? Uh, or the, this guy who said, build the tallest structure with 20 sticks. But I think you need both. I mean, uh, there's nothing sadder than someone who believes that is creative without the technical uh, ability to back it up. So uh, I think you have to kind of operate this, this balance, but with some little tweaking in between, I think you could uh, inspire people, but you have to kind of insert things here and there. Uh, and let's face it, not everybody has to to be kind of balanced in this way. But my belief is that, especially in engineering, physics, that kind of thing, you is absolutely necessary that you have the technical skills to back it up. Without that, you have no game. Yeah. I just thought of, uh, you know, thinking a little louder uh, on two comments. One is you said that uh, don't, uh, you know, keep your thoughts fluid and don't freeze it. You know, give some time for the thoughts to flow. Yeah. But the kind of age you are living in today, you know, you're always running against time. I mean, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm coming from business school. Mm -hmm. So the business is always looking at how to stay ahead of competition. Mm -hmm. So do you have that kind of time that you, you have that, uh, you know, pleasure of luxury of, uh, you know, uh, the thoughts flowing in and then waiting for something to concretize. That's one. And second is on the last, which you said that seeing simplicity in complexity and complexity in simplicity. I was wondering whether the same human being can have this combination balancing between I can see complexity and simplicity and I can also see the simplicity and complexity. I, 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 can, I can imagine several people who can do that. I, I wouldn't put myself as an example of doing both, but probably, probably I, I, I would argue that you have to... So, for example, in the context of of what I did with the bank, uh, there was one very, very simple picture, which was this picture of horseshoes and stretching and folding. That was like the DNA. It was not a given that that was the right picture. I mean, there were so many competing things out there. But then, once you have that, you have to have a sense of how many other things this can lead to. And I think I had the sense and the bank had the sense. So there are several people who can do that. Regarding the first part, there is another phrase which I often use. Uh, in Italian is uh, impara l'arte e mettila da parte, which means learn the craft and then set it aside. Because if you learn the craft and everything that you do is result of that craft, you will never be able to go into new territory. You have to, some, but the difference of the pressure of doing something, deadlines, this and that, is that you have to decide what to optimize. If you want to optimize something here, but the gain will be relatively small, or at some point take the time and get a great picture sometime afterwards. I don't think that in academic careers, you can have more than three great ideas, okay? But those ideas probably last for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. So, but, uh, but it takes, once you have picked something and you are locked into it, it's very hard to walk away from it. So I think the idea of 
taking time to decide what you want to lock in is critical. I mean, there are branches of science in which the degree of inertia, for example, heavy experimental things, once you have made an investment, it's very hard to make a sharp corner. I, I always try to do things, for example, in my case, and I think the bank is another perfect example where it's almost des desktop science, very cheap investments, but you can adapt with the times and you are not locked into anything. You, you just, it's a luxury. You never have a group of 30 people, but you live lighter, you can maneuver more effectively. You are not like an oil tanker, you are more like a kind of a speedboat. So. The same token, can you do two at a time if you have you know, trains running on time. Oh, I think that's probably a very good idea. And there are many people who will tell you that working on two or three parallel things. I, I, will, I will summarize this by giving you the three essential elements of creative people, okay? Uh, I'm completely quoting in here on someone who I deeply admire, and it's Herb Simon, who was at Carnegie Mellon won the Nobel Prize of Economics, he could have won it for anything. He was associated with artificial intelligence and this and that. So one was deep knowledge in an area and related areas. He said 10 years. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell publicized this as 10,000 hours. This applies from child prodigies to Mozart to Bobby Fischer, deep knowledge. Um, the second thing was a ability to hold a problems in background thinking for a long, long, long time without acting on. And the third one, which is the most, is like a litmus test for creativity, is the ability to deal with loosely structured ideas and structure them in the process of time. And this makes many people uncomfortable. They, they want to see the idea sort of perfect, and while it's messy, they kind of lose patience, or they don't interplay well with other people, they, they demand. But the, the benefits in anything goes to the first person who did the first sketch of something. And then what remains in, in science is the augmentation, the cleaning up, the beautification, throwing more and more technical stuff on top of it until, I mean, when you're at the beginning of something, you, you get after 10 years paper to review and you have no idea what these people are doing because it's so heavily shrouded in math that is unrecognizable. But the, the, the initial idea was there. So these three elements, deep knowledge, ability to keep ideas for a long time in background, and then the ability to structure things. I, I completely agree with Herb Simon. That those are like the three basic ingredients of anything that has been deemed creative than by anybody. Now, Notwithstanding the examples that I showed at the beginning that do exist of someone like Ramanujan or someone like Galois that seemingly out of nowhere, the ideas kind of flow, sorts of flew in their heads and you have no idea how, okay? Because Ramanujan dying at uh, 32 or Galois 20, uh, that, that kind of is borderline for these 10 years of experience. So thank you again so much for the opportunity, okay? Thank you. I'm sure you, each one of you would have found this uh, uh, talk to be thought-provoking and fascinating. I would like to request Professor Khatkar to present this memento to Professor Otino. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.